Today I want to briefly look into image segmentation using the so-called mean shift algorithm. So we want to dive a little bit into the details on kind of how can we basically segment similar regions in an image as belonging together. And that's something which can actually be quite useful when we analyze images or look for similar regions in an image. So consider you have an aerial image of here some landscape. Um, these are kind of agricultural fields in this example. And the question is now how can we actually um, identify similar regions just based on this image without providing any additional background information or um, training data on how such an image should be segmented. Just by saying we want to group similar things together. One example how that could look like is here shown by these kind of outlines, basically show areas which are similar to each other and we are breaking down the image content into similar regions. And this again can be used you know, to say, okay, this is a field of type A, this is a field of type B, Maybe we have a second type of field B sitting next to it, so I could have also segmented it together, but it didn't happen over here. There's a field type C, this may be a road. Um, so we can add different types of information to these individual regions, just as an example. So um, quite often we're actually faced with a problem that we have data points, in this case these are pixels in an image, um, which we want to actually group together. And that's something which is typically called a clustering problem. And often this is kind of an it's called an unsupervised process. So I'm just saying, okay, here is my raw data. See what you think is similar. And typically, I need to provide a measure of similarity to this algorithm and let the algorithm group similar items together. Typically doing this, again, without training data. So without telling the system, okay, here are 10,000 images, which I grouped in the following way, the items in there. Please do it similarly. That would be an approach which uses so-called training data or a supervised algorithm. We want to do this here unsupervised without this uh, type of training data. So clustering is a problem in general, it's not just holds for images, of grouping similar data points or items or pixels uh, or regions in an image and represent them with a single entity or with a single token. <clears throat> this can be an element that stems from those data points or could also be an average of those data points. And this is a tool which is useful not only in image analysis or photogrammetry or computer vision, um, but also for a large number of other tasks. We will focus here on the lecture on images and exploit certain properties for images or algorithms which work specifically well on images. We don't looking into general clustering where algorithms such as whatever well, the k-means algorithm is probably the most popular one. Um, we are just losing, using here or looking here into image context and this becomes the clustering there becomes useful, for example, if you want to look for similar regions, you want to analyze your image, or even for visualizing high dimensional data um, for all these types of tasks, clustering can actually be a useful tool. So the goal is we have an image and we want to break down the image into regions. So this could be in this um, example over here. This is a region which I may later on define as a lake. Um, we have a region over here which could be green could be kind of rocky beach over here, could be clouds over here, blue sky over here. The important thing to notice, I'm not providing those labels at the moment. I'm not saying that this is actually a sky and this is a cloud and this is a lake. I just say the system try to find similar looking regions. Um, and I want to do this without this additional training data. I may just saying, okay, in pixel intensity values which are similar up to whatever, 10 intensity values are probably things which are similar. So this is information that I typically need to provide to this algorithm if I don't provide training data. So I need to give the algorithm an idea what means close to each other and what means um, far away from each other. So a measure of similarity is typically something that I have to provide at some point in time to these types of algorithms if I don't provide examples of what I think is close and what I think is different from each other. Okay, so key challenges in this General clustering problem is kind of what makes two data points look similar or areas in an image which, uh, uh, which are similar and um, how do we compute actually an overall grouping from a pairwise grouping. So just being able to say two data points are similar to each other um, doesn't or is not necessarily enough information to say how the whole image consisting of a large number of data points should actually be grouped together. Um, again, this is a general clustering approach and there are different techniques how to do that. I want to look today into the mean shift algorithm and especially using them for segmenting images. So uh, it's kind of a specialized form to the task that in this lecture we are um, partially concerned with. 
And the mean shift algorithm has been developed around um, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's a very versatile technique for performing this clustering in images and leading to a segmentation of those images. So there are two examples of landscape um, segmentations that have been generated with the mean shift algorithm. And you can actually see that you get a segmentation which is actually quite similar to what a human would probably do and actually um, combine semantic information together. So saying the lake is here kind of grouped together. But it's important to note that this semantic information is not explicitly provided here to that system. It's just based on the definition of similarity that different data points are grouped together over here. And what we want to do is in actually providing now with an algorithm that allows us to find those regions. And the mean shift algorithm does this in a certain way in the, in the way that it actually performs a non-parametric um, density estimation. So a density estimation says, okay, we have certain features in that space and um, certain features occur very often or solve which are similar to each other and I can see the whole thing as a, um, as a density function. <clears throat> so I have my input uh, values which could be pixel values, which could be intensity values, which could be RGB values, which could be a combination of RGB values and XY locations in an image or I can add texture information to this. So whatever it actually is, um, I can have this two, three, four, five, whatever dimensional space which I define my density function on. And then if I have data points which are very close together as illustrated over here, I actually say, okay, this density function should take higher values in here because the concentration of these data points is higher in this region. There's a very low density of data points over here, right? So this corresponds to this area. If you visualize this as kind of a hilly surface as mountains, you would see that the mountain is very peaked in areas where there are a lot of data points and the mountain is very flat and small in areas where there are nearly no or just a few data points. So this uh, mean shift algorithm performs a form of density estimation and then what it does, it says, okay, from which starting point in this space over here, if I just kind of always walk uphill, to which mountain peak will I actually go? If I just walk uphill, never downhill again, only uphill. So if I'm starting somewhere over here, I will actually end up at that mountain peak over here, this red dot over here. If I start somewhere over here, I will end up at this mountain peak. If I start over here, I will also end up at that mountain peak. If I start here, I will end up at this mountain peak. And if I'm starting here in this area, I will all end up at this high mountain peak. So these black lines are basically path walking uphill of data points reaching this hill. And basically all data points in this surface which would walk through the same mountain peak are grouped together, are clustered together, form one cluster. That's kind of the core idea of the mean shift algorithm. And it does so by basically starting in an area and then always walking uphill. So saying, okay, given a local estimate of this density, um, uh, of this density over here, um, where do I need to walk into increase the density? Because increasing density means walking uphill towards the peak of that mountain. And then basically seeing at which data point I'm ending up at which mountain peak, and this provides me with my, um, with my, with my clusters or my regions um, that should be grouped together. That's kind of the, the core idea behind it. So it's a combination of estimating a, a PDF or a density function um, and finding the maxima, so the extremas, the modes of that distribution. And all the data points um, starting there, always moving in areas which get more likely or they have a higher density better. Um, at, the, at the peaks where I'm ending up, these are basically my, um, my clusters. So basically the, the point that belong or lead to if I kind of walk uphill, where do I end up, which mountain peak or which mode um, is actually the element which defines my cluster. So I'm starting with a local density estimation, this approach, and then always try to walk into regions where the density increases. And we can actually illustrate this in a quite nice way. So consider this is my spread of data points, at least a local view on my spread of data points. And I'm just starting randomly somewhere, at a random point, either a point that comes from the data, from the data uh, or some other point in that space, and I want to say, okay, where is that mountain peak? To which mountain peak does my start point actually belong to? What we're going to do is 
Now we go through this example and see to which mountain peak does this approach actually lead us to. Okay, so let's start. We have a data point which we start with over here. And this data point has a region of interest. It basically tells me something like the local area, a local region of interest that I should take into account in order to um, estimate the local density. Right? So, and this is something that I as a user need to provide. Okay, basically what's the size of this region of interest and what is how strong should data points impact this data point over here. So for example, if I make this region extremely small, this, if this is my data point, I make it extremely small, there would be no point falling in this region. There's no um, kind of local density I can actually estimate, because, or only a zero density that I can estimate, and this doesn't help me if I want to walk uphill. If I'm in a completely flat land, I don't know where to go. Okay, so I define a neighborhood which should include a couple of neighboring points that I can use to locally approximate this density function. If I, of course, make this circle too huge, let's say the whole space, then it's basically the whole space. I'm basically flattening everything out and I will just only find in the end a single mean because I'm taking into account all the data points into estimating a local density. So my local density would immediately be a global density and just a, uni or, um, a unimodal distribution in the end, um, which is something I typically don't want to have. I want to find the points which are lead to the to I want to group those together, which leads to the same mountain peak in my density um, in my density function. But of course, if I want to have multiple clusters, it means there should be actually multiple mountain peaks. Okay, so what we are doing, we are now collecting all the points in this region of interest in order to compute a local density. So how do we actually do this? How do we compute? the uh, a local PDF in a non-parametric way. And I don't want to do it in a non-parametric way because I can't assume this, for example, to be a Gaussian or following uh, a, a special distribution. I just have those points over here. And what we're typically doing is we are performing, we are using a function, a so-called kernel function, and used to average over the neighboring point saying, what is the impact on that, of that point on the density at that location? What is the impact of this point on the density here at that location? And what you often have is the closer you're to that point, the higher the impact, the further you're away, the smaller the impact. So this point should have a smaller, a higher impact, sorry, this point should have a higher impact on the density at that point compared to this point over here or this point at the boundary of that neighborhood. And what we are typically doing, we are saying, okay, let's fit a small distribution typically kind of symmetric shape around these individual data points and we can kind of sum them up. You can see this as fitting a small Gaussian distribution around all those um, uh, red points over here and then basically estimate the, of all the points that fall into this region um, what the sum of these uh, Gaussians would actually look like and this uh, I can use to say this is a local distribution, an approximation of a local distribution. And this is um, uh, what is called kernel density estimation or parts and window estimation, where I'm basically, <clears throat> what I'm doing, I'm defining a local neighborhood. So this was a circle that I've shown before, and I'm iterating over all data points in this circle here called M, the data points XM. And I'm saying, how far is this data point actually away from my query point? So the query point X would be this one, and this would be my different XM values over here. And um, then I typically do this with a kernel, which has the, takes the distance into account between, between this and typically some normalizing factor. And you can actually see that this is something that looks very much as the, um, the, the parameter that you put, put in the exponent of a Gaussian distribution. So if you take a Gaussian kernel, um, so with this size and put it in here, then you can actually see that this gives you basically a Gaussian smoothing of those individual points. Okay, if we do so, let's see how that looks like, what happens. So we take our point, our region of interest, and then saying, okay, if we now compute the weighted sum of all those points, taking into account the, the density distribution, this will be a new center of mass. So I'm basically, this is my uphill walk along, this, um, uh, um, along those points. So what I'm doing, I'm actually computing a vector which shifts my mean, the weighted mean of these points over here, um, to this new location. Because for all the points considered in this neighborhood, 
the, the weighted mean of those points is actually lies over here. Okay, so I'm basically shifting this point over here. It's called the mean shift vector, and then I'm repeating this process. I began computing a new mean, computing the shift vector, and moving these, um, the, this circle over here. And this is basically my uphill work. I'm looking in the local neighborhood, what's the density of points around me, and I'm moving towards those points where the density increases. So this is basically the uphill walk that I'm doing in this algorithm. Okay, I can repeat this process, another uphill walk, move, uh, move further until I'm basically at the point where I'm basically overlapping with, or roughly overlapping up to epsilon around the, um, the point. So basically I found the mountain peak here at this point. So how do I compute this? Um, this, uh, this mean shift, so this vector that I'm shifting. So it's basically a discrepancy between the data point that I had before and the uh, sum over all the data points in the neighborhood together with the weight. So how far is this point away under my kernel function from the current estimate that I'm having, performing the appropriate normalization so that things are appropriately normalized to one, and then I'm actually moving in this direction. So it's basically this direction of the weighted mean. So this basically tells me where should I go, what's the update step that I'm actually doing. And for that, um, we need to define what is kind of this window over here. And this window is basically defined through this M over here, of which points I'm iterating. And it also kind of has some dependency with the, um, with the value over here. So even if I take more points into account, but if A, um, depending on the size of H, they may basically drop to a zero impact further outside here. So again, this is X is my starting point where I started, and then that's where I'm actually moving to, and so this gives me my mean shift vector. And I'm basically always walking along the mean shift. So it's kind of the, the local mountain peak given my local view. That's how you can actually visualize this. So the circle here is kind of the local view from your starting point, and you're saying, okay, where's, the, where's my mountain peak under this kernel function in my local viewpoint, and that's actually where you're moving to. And this way, you're gradually moving upwards. So if you, for example, have two kind of clusters over here in the sense that they are, this is a, this is a spread of points in this, in the X, illustrating the XY space, and all the points which fall into this kind of blue shape will actually end up here at that mountain peak, and all the values over here will end up here at that mountain peak, <clears throat> then these two regions, the red one and the blue one, will form the two regions, the two clusters in um, in, in this space, in this image, and so these areas are also called kind of the basin of attraction, so where you're attracted to the same mode, and this basically forms your clusters. So all data points lying in your basin of attraction, which will be dragged to the same mode, actually defines the region where you're going to look into. And the same over here in this initial example that I had, so if these are, is my, my points, um, in my two-dimensional um, color space in this example, then we can actually color them based on in which mode they actually end up. And so you can see kind of this kind of the, 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 the top-down view of this view, or the same view as this view over here, but basically colored, where the color indicates in which mode they actually end up with. So all the data points which lie here in this region, and again, this is not an XY space, it's a color space, so all points which lie in here will actually end up at that mountain peak. All points are here, will end up in, uh, okay, I don't need to do that well. Uh, okay, this area seems to be this area over here, and there are three more, one, two, three, so these three should be this area over here, this straight line should be these, this straight line over here. So this one is this one, this one corresponds to this one, that one corresponds to this one, and the green, the yellow one is actually this highest peak over here. So I can basically start for every point and see where I'm ending up, and this provides me my clustering, my mean shift. Okay, so um, what the mean shift does, it actually tries to seek for the modes of the density function of points, so basically increasing in density. And if you want to form this as an algorithm, the key steps are we are, um, the first thing we have to do is we have to choose a kernel, so which kernel function to use, such as the Gaussian kernel and the bandwidth of my h parameter, and also need to define my neighborhood, although this is kind of related with each other. 
And um, what I then do for every data point that I have, so for every pixel in my image basically, I'm centering this local window around this point. Then I need to compute the mean um, of the data points in my search window. So I'm basically looking to the neighborhood of that point and computing this mean shift vector and then send, moving along this mean shift, always moving on until I'm ending up at, a, at, the, at the new mean location or the, at my mode. Um, and then I'm repeating these steps for um, until I converge. And then for every data point, I basically have reached my point, uh, my, my, my mountain peak and store, okay, this point ended up in mountain peak number one, this point ended up in mountain peak number two, and this then provides me with the relevant uh, cluster information. So then I basically assign all points which are at the same mountain peak or very close to the same mountain peak as forming the same cluster. And that's a way how I can segment my image effectively into different regions. So something you need to take into account, what is your input to that? So if you define a kernel, and again, a standard choice is the Gaussian kernel over here, on what is this actually computed? And this can be, as I already illustrated before, a multidimensional um, space. So it can be color information, but typically you also want to take the position in the image into account. Quite often you don't want to have something green down here and something green up here being actually grouped together to the same peak. I mean, sometimes you want to have that, then you would ignore the pose information or position information in the image. But maybe you want to take that into account. So your input space is not necessarily one-dimensional or two-dimensional as was shown over here. It can also have higher dimension, also taking different times of features into account. So you need to be able to compute a feature for every pixel. This can be the color information, the position. This could also be gradient information, basically taking a local neighborhood into account. What are the stradients or what information do I have about texture? And then for this individual dimensions, I may need to define um, different kernels. So because I most likely will have a different kernel if I'm thinking about intensity values compared to XY space or some measure for um, a texture or something like this. So I typically have different, um, different kernel sizes over here, so different radii where I'm actually looking for neighbors. And again, then standard process, initialize the window at every location, perform the mean shift, and then basically performing the merging operation based on, um, on data points that are where the, the final position that I actually found that are within this, uh, the kernel size of my kernel. So basically grouping in similar points where I ended up at similar locations. And if I do this, I actually get pretty good results for the, um, for the image segmentation. And it's actually an approach where you don't have too many parameters to tweak. I mean, you need to define your kernel function and define this, um, your, your input space, but then it's basically just the kernel size for those individual features that you need to tweak in order to get different results out. So this is an example of the input images shown over here and the output images shown over here. And you can actually see by the uniform colors that the approach actually does a pretty good job in segmenting this image. Of course, there are some mistakes if you think about the kind of semantics, um, if you see this semantic uh, segmentation, so to say, where every pixel would be a semantic class. So this is basically a shadow on the pathway. Of course, it takes a different color over here because it appears to be different, and the system doesn't know that this uh, shadow doesn't change the environment. It's actually the same footpath over here. Of course, it's something that we can't expect such a system to do if we don't provide it with examples. We just said what looks different, what does not look different. And this kind of dark or blackish pixel, dark gray pixel, um, of course, looks very different to this light gray pixel um, and thus will be grouped into a different uh, segment. But that's kind of a very much expected for an approach that is not trained with training data specifically. Um, similar examples from those landscapes images, but you can see here there's actually a very reasonable segmentation and the results that are shown here are pretty good for considering the quality um, of the segmentation and given that you don't provide labeled training examples, a completely unsupervised approach, you only need to specify your distance function or what you consider as close to each other, basically through that kernel. So a few pros and cons, what's good, what's bad about the mean shift algorithm. So it's, what's very good is it's a very general approach. We can basically apply this to any type of image data or even data outside the image domain and works fairly well. 
compared to other algorithms, you do not specify how many clusters you actually have. With other algorithms, such as the k-means algorithm, you need to specify, okay, I'm expecting to have five different regions or five different segments in my image. And you don't have that here. By just estimating the means of this, um, uh, of the density function, the means or the modes of the density function, not the means, the modes of the density function basically defines the number of segments that you have out there. And that's actually pretty good. And also you are fairly robust with respect to outliers because you have this smoothing kernel into, have this smoothing into account. So if you have individual outliers, they can actually be smoothed out away quite well. Um, the disadvantage is that you have to choose those kernel sizes in advance, and this may be a bit tricky, it, especially if it's something which is not related to the kind of location in the image, but it's something related to some features which are harder to interpret. And you want to take those features into account, you need to be able to specify this kind of what means close, what means neighborhood, and the, the different size of the neighborhood can have a very big impact on your final result, depending if um, different segments actually group together or um, you have an over-segmentation that you have actually too many um, regions which are actually identical are broken up into multiple different regions. And again, this doesn't work that well for um, higher dimensional features, um, but for this standard image task that actually works fairly well. So this was a brief excursion into clustering and only looking into clustering for image segmentation. But I want to point out that this is a, clustering itself is a more general approach that can be used for completely different tasks than just grouping similar regions and images together. So it's basically grouping data points, and we have no idea where those data points are, where they come from, um, into similar items. And the only thing we need to know for that is um, a distance function to define typically pairwise similarity. And clustering is an approach which is typically referred to as unsupervised compared to supervised approaches where we provide label information. We don't need training data or label training data here for those clustering approaches. But again, we need to specify a distance function. And the mean shift algorithm is one popular technique in order to do that and leads to pretty good results in the context of um, image-based segmentation. But I want to point out that there is a large number of other techniques, um, Gaussian mixture model estimation, agglomerative clustering, or k-means, with probably k-means being the most popular algorithm for performing uh, clustering. So if you want to dive deeper into clustering, there are much more things you may want to dive deeper into here for this task of um, dealing with images. The mean shift is a good standard choice that you may want to start with when you're considering to uh, clustering uh, image data and combining regions in an image into kind of regions of the same type. With this, I say thank you very much for your attention Actually, the original work published now around 20 years ago um, on mean shift actually provides a pretty good explanation of what it, what it is and how it works, but you can also look into the Slinsky book for further details on clustering in the context of images. With this, thank you very much for your attention.